Hello, my name is Deb Arns, and I'm the Senior Museum Curator at the Nebraska State Historical Society, and I'd like to welcome you all today to the Society's Museum of Nebraska History and our Brown Bag Lecture Series. Before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to thank the Nebraska State Historical Society Foundation for providing funding for the taping of this program. Today's program is Amendment 1, an opportunity to preserve Nebraska's history, and our speaker is Bill Callahan. Bill has been with the Historical Society State Historic Preservation Office since 1994. He works with the Nebraska Historic Building Survey, the National Register of Historic Places, and certified local government programs. Bill worked in the Illinois State Historic Preservation Office from 1989 to 1994, where he saw firsthand how a program such as that proposed by Amendment 1 works. If you would, please welcome Bill Calhoun. Thanks, Deb. Uh, good afternoon. Thanks for coming. Um, if you have any questions about the West Coast offense, I stopped listening when Mike Holmgren left the Packers, so that's not me. Uh, what we're here to today to discuss is Amendment 1, which is a proposal to amend uh, Nebraska's Constitution. It'll be on the November 2nd general election ballot. Uh, I work for the Nebraska State Historical Society. I'm a state employee. <clears throat> Pardon me. Um, this discussion today um, is uh, going to be one of, of public information. Um, uh, the State Historic Preservation Office, the division I work in, um, served as a research tool for the legislature as this process went through the as this program went through the legislature. Uh, and um, uh, we're kind of the most logical people to, and as Deb mentioned, I worked in a program um, that would be similar to something like this in Illinois. Um, what I say today should be in no way construed as being uh, 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 advocating for Amendment 1 one way or the other. Um, this is strictly a, a public service. Um, uh, in order to let people make an informed decision about Amendment 1 because um, we in the State Historic Preservation Office um, and the, the State Historical Society's headquarters building is just down the street at the end of Centennial Mall. The State Preservation Office is located across the street on the third floor of the Children's Museum. We received, we have been receiving for some time now um, a lot of questions about what Amendment 1 is, what the implications of it are, maybe, um, and, and, and how people um, want to understand it. Um, uh, <clears throat> so what I'd like to do is to try to help um, clear up some of the things that, um, answer some of the questions, anticipate some of the questions that people have had for our office. Uh, the State Historic Preservation Office is a division of the State Historical Society. We maintain five different federal historic preservation programs. We receive some funding from the National Park Service to do these programs. Uh, when, um, whenever anybody hears me speak, I always tell everybody that you know, when I talk about things, I, I, I talk in, in the context of federal regulations and federal guidelines because that's what we have to follow because the Park Service helps pay the bills. Um, so that's, that's who we are. Uh, what is Amendment 1? Well, simply speaking, Amendment 1 is a proposal to amend the Nebraska Constitution to allow for the passage of future legislation um, that would um, create a historic preservation incentive using what's commonly known as a, a property tax valuation assessment freeze, a, a, an assessment freeze or, or abatement program. Um, and this, this freeze, as it's written um, in the uh, ballot language, and we'll get to that a little bit later, um, uh, is for only for the increased value as it applies to um, a rehabilitation project. Why? Why was the legislature interested in, in presenting something like this to the voters? Well, Nebraska is the only state in the nation that doesn't have some kind of historic preservation incentive, at least on the books. Um, and in our research that we uh, provided for the legislature, we found um, that the most common form of preservation incentive uh, nationally is this uh, idea of a property tax assessment freeze. 37 states across the nation have some form of this type of preservation incentive. And those states cross the, the demographic, geographic, and political spectrum from Montana to Hawaii to Maine and all the way into the, into the uh, southwest. 
So this is the type of program that we saw that was the most uh, uh, popular across the country. Um, nationally, uh, you, you find preservation incentives that include things like straight grant programs, uh, uh, revolving loan funds, um, uh, state income tax credits for preservation purposes, things of that nature. But the one that we found the most often was uh, this uh, assessment freeze. Around in our neighboring states, if you take a look and see what everybody else is doing, um, you'll find that, <coughs> pardon me, uh, three of our neighboring states, South Dakota, Kansas, and, and uh, Iowa, have uh, an assessment freeze program for preservation purposes. Um, interestingly, Colorado, um, with the $15 million grant program, um, funds that program by, uh, they have allowed casino gambling in uh, three historic mountain mining communities, and a percentage of the profits of, the, of those casino operations go towards the preservation grant program. Um, that's why that's such a large number. I think it started out as $4 million, and it's grown to $15 million. But the, as again, the, the assessment incentive, um, as you can see just from our neighboring states, is uh, the one that's most popular uh, even in the plains. Um, as you might imagine, with 37 states having passed this type of, of, of incentive, there are a lot of variations in how different states operate it, but there are two constants, two things that we can say nationally are the things that every state does, or at least every state that we're aware of does. Um, and that is defining what an historic building is. Everyone has, you know, in their own minds a different idea of what historic means. Um, there's a commonality across state, state nationally about what, how to define historic. And there's also a commonality. Um, the, the, as, as you remember from the, the first slide, um, the assessment freeze applies to uh, uh, the assessment as it uh, occurs re uh, from a rehabilitation, a certified rehabilitation. We have to make a definition of rehabilitation because after all we're talking about historic buildings. We don't want to, if by uh, in, uh, giving an incentive for these rehabilitations, we want to make sure they stay historic. We don't want the rehabilitation to be a, a rehabilitation that destroys the historic quality or character of the building. So we have to define what rehabilitation means. Um, and we'll start with maybe the easiest one to figure out because it's uh, pretty cut and dried. There is every state, actually, every state has one preservation incentive, and that's the federal income tax credit for historic preservation purposes. Uh, we have that in Nebraska. Um, it's a 20 percent federal income tax uh, that um, uh, the owners of income producing historic properties, remember that income producing historic properties, can use with a substantial rehabilitation of their historic property. These tend to be uh, uh, large, high dollar projects. It's not always the case, but generally they're, they're very large projects, high dollar. If you think about um, Lincoln's Haymarket, the Omaha Rail and Commerce Historic District, the Omaha Old Market area, the redevelopment of those areas was all uh, in a very large way funded by using the federal income tax preservation credit. Every state um, can avail themselves of this. We, we administer this program in our office for the state of Nebraska. Every state defines, has to, because it's a federal program, defines rehabilitation as uh, the federal uh, rehab standards, which are known as, and this is the only time I'll say this, is a very awkward title, they're known as the Secretary of the Interior's Standards for Rehabilitation and Guidelines for Rehabilitating Historic Buildings. Try saying that fast three times. <laughs> It'll be bedtime. Uh, what the, what the secretary standards do, they're, they're very common sense, very commonly applied. The, the federal rehab credit's been around since 1976, so the standards have been around for at least that long. The very common sense, very broad uh, uh, standards that can be applied across a broad spectrum of, of t property types and, and, and areas. After all, they have to apply to all 50 states and all different kinds of historic properties. So uh, the rehab credits, for example, uh, the, the uh, stand secretary standards, the federal uh, preservation standards, the rehabilitation standards, um, uh, for it kind of work like the Hippocratic Oath that the doctors take. First, do no harm. If a building doesn't need anything done to it, don't do anything to it if it's a historic building. Um, if there are elements that are historic in character, architectural character, historic character, that, that need to be repaired, they should be repaired instead of replaced if possible. If it's impossible to re repair them, they should be replaced in kind in terms of materials and configuration uh, uh, and, and so on. Um, <clears throat> uh, very easy to use. And every state that has, that we're aware of, that has an assessment uh, uh, incentive, this is what we're talking about here, that Amendment 1 would enable, um, every other state uses the Secretary of Interior Standards, the Federal Preservation Standards, as their definition of what a rehabilitation is. Okay. The second commonality, that's the first commonality, the second commonality across the nation then is how, they, how states define 
historic. Uh, the National Register of Historic Places is um, how offices such as ours define historic buildings. And every state that uh, uses this type of incentive uses the National Register of Historic Places or they steal the language from the National Register to uh, define what historic, what an historic building is. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to, as I mentioned, our office administers the National Register um, for the state of Nebraska. There are th three misperceptions that we deal with in our office about the National Register and about historic preservation that we deal with on almost a daily basis. The first is, if you list a building in the National Register, you can't touch it. It's frozen in stone. Uh, nobody can ever harm it. Um, it costs a lot of money to, to do anything to it. All absolutely untrue. The National Register of places, places absolutely no restrictions whatsoever in any way, shape, or form on um, a property that's listed. None. On a, on a, in, in, without question. Personal property um, listed in the National Register has no restrictions whatsoever. The second misperception that we deal with on almost a daily basis, basis is that there are bags of money out there. If you can just get your building listed at the National Register, there's all these grants out there that you can pile the money into them with. Also completely untrue. There's not a dime, not a nickel. Um, in Nebraska. Um, there's certainly no federal programs that, that provides grant funds for uh, National Register buildings. There's no money at all in Nebraska. There's no other incentive for historic buildings. Um, the third misperception is that um, national, the National Register and historic preservation applies to the rich white guy's castle on the hill, um, and that's that's what we that's what we talk about all the time. Or the most spectacular examples of architecture that we can find, like the Nebraska State Capitol, national historic landmark, because of its because of its architecture. Or properties that have so, are so steeped in history that everybody can understand how important they are, like Fort Robinson uh, out in the out in the Panhandle, which has got so many cross currents of history going through it. It's, it would take me all day just to describe them. Um, those are all historic properties, certainly, and they certainly are all properties that we deal with in terms of historic preservation, um, absolutely. But in terms of how we approach historic preservation um, as an office and as a community, truly, is um, much broader than that. Um, in fact, we deal um, actually quite rarely with buildings of national or statewide significance. If you think about it, there aren't very many properties out there that, ha that have a meaning and importance to everybody. Um, what the National Register recognizes is that our shared histories and the communities that we live in are where history really happens. That local significance, the, the properties that have significance to us in our communities are those that are most deserving of National Register recognition. Um, in fact, in our, in we, we, did, we didn't do an exact calculation, but up in the 90th, 90s percentage um, in our office, uh, uh, buildings that are listed in the National Register are listed because of their local significance, not because they have statewide or, or national significance. Um, and that's a very important thing to keep in mind when you're thinking about things like Amendment 1 or any other type of historic preservation activity. It's important to keep in mind that almost, almost entirely, we talk almost entirely about historic preservation as as, as a managing change within a community, managing change to those properties that have meaning to, to all of us in the communities in which we live. Um, so let's, let's talk about what that means. Um, uh, <clears throat> again, keep in mind that these are, this is a program that we administer for the National Park Service, um, and I'd like to kind of give you an idea of, of what, what, what we're talking about, that we're not talking about the Joslin Castle all the time, we're not talking about the Nebraska State Capitol, um, but what we are talking about is, are, those, are those buildings that mean something to us in the communities in which we all, we all live across the state. Um, just for a, a, an example, um, we have here two individual properties listed in the National Roads for Places here in Lincoln, um, the Guy Brown House over on 27th Street and the Nimrod Rod House. Guy Brown um, built his house in 1874. Guy Brown was a, a clerk to the Supreme Court, prominent Lincolnian, Lincoln citizen, um, president of the school board, uh, and built this nice house in 1874, the Nimrod Rod House. Nimrod Ross was born in slavery. Um, in the 1860s. We're not sure what date, of course. Um, and he lived well into the 20th century. Um, and this was his home. So what we have here are two, um, one kind of very clearly historic, architecturally significant building, and another more vernacular, if you will, or more, um, uh, not as uh, much more plain uh, building that um, are both listed in the National Register of Places. Uh, we recognize, of course, that buildings with architectural significance uh, 
um, can be listed the National Register. This is a, an Art Modern building um, in Scotts Bluff. Generally speaking, the National Register recognizes properties that are 50 years old or older um, as, as historic. Um, so we can take into account things that are n not always considered necessarily historic. As those of us who are approaching 50 can say, it kind of makes my heart bleed when I think about buildings that are younger than I am, at least in the National Register. Um, we look at specific architectural styles like this Queen Anne house, the Mayberry McPherson house in Antelope County. Um, we look at um, even, uh, again, more vernacular, kind of even more commonplace houses. This is the Heber Horde house in Central City. Um, the National Register recognizes broad patterns of historic events or contexts or uh, individual events that are significant to our past. It also recognizes individual significant to our past and those places that have meaning to them. Um, in the Heber Horde house, Heber Horde was a uh, a prominent um, uh, stockman in Central City, um, and this was his house. Uh, the National Register obviously also recognizes things of great architectural significance. Um, this is the Mary Rogers Kimball House designed by her son, uh, T.R. Kimball, um, probably Nebraska's uh, most famous architect, um, and a pretty obvious example of, a, of an architecturally significant building. Uh, we also, of course, recognize uh, things that, that, that as time marches on, we look back and we see things that have significance that we may not have recognized even 10 years ago. This is a late 1940s um, post-war, uh, basically a ranch house outside of Ogallala that, that very clearly represents architectural and historic trends um, in, in the country um, that, that were happening after the war. And it's listed the National Register. Across the state then, south um, and southwest Nebraska and Hayes County, we have the, the, the John Daniel House. Stone house built on the high plains, lovely setting, surrounded by cottonwoods, uh, built by a, a prominent, at that time, prominent rancher in, in the area. Um, we also have to recognize, as we're thinking about historic properties and what, what that means, <clears throat> is that uh, different, different regions of the state and different areas of the state have different things that mean, that have significance to, to in certain regions, but maybe not to another. This is a, 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 a um, Dutch colonial revival property. Um, in Sheridan County, the, the, the Lee and Gottlieb Fritz house. In Lincoln or Omaha, this property, this house probably wouldn't make us think twice. There's a lot of them like this. This is the only Dutch colonial revival residence in all of Sheridan County, which is larger than Delaware. So in terms of this area, this, this particular architectural, pro architecturally significant property is listed in the National Register. So we have to recognize that, that, we, that, that, that these historic properties across the state have, have meaning in certain areas, they may not in others, but they're still um, very important to the communities in which they're located. Uh, the Burke residence in Geneva, again, when people, if they think about the National Register at all, they think about historic buildings at all, pretty obvious example, a beautiful brick Queen Anne building, um, uh, recently very um, substantially rehabilitated by the family that bought it a few years ago. Um, and again, not only regional variations in, in architecture in terms of what you, what you, what you see in terms of high-style architecture, uh, or, uh, but, uh, but also in, in, in regional types, um, the, these, these, these quote-unquote hacienda homes, we didn't know what else to call them, that we found, we can, you can't you can find throughout the Panhandle, and sometimes a little bit farther east, um, are regional uh, property type that, that, you're, that you're not going to find really um, anywhere else in the state that you see. Um, there. So we recognize that in that part of the state, this is something that, that has some significance, and there's a story there. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a story that's telling us something about the people who, who built the buildings and, and, and were in that area. Um, there are about 900 properties in Nebraska listed in the National Red Historic Places. About 40 of those are historic districts. Historic districts can be listed in the National Register. And they are collections of buildings that individually, the individual buildings themselves may not be a good candidate necessarily for the National Register, but taken as a whole, taken as a collection, they tell us something significant about our past. They tell us something about settlement patterns. They tell, tell us something about ethnic uh, uh, settlement. They tell us something about regional um, commercial patterns. Um, and uh, in terms of sheer numbers of buildings, um, historic districts probably make up the majority of National Register properties. Um, a very good example, of course, here is in Lincoln is the South Bottoms, a very large historic district over 400 buildings uh, made up of, uh, built, built there primarily by, by um, Germans from Russia, immigrants, who brought their architectural styles with them, um, built them here in Lincoln, um, and as a, tells us a great deal about a very significant um, ethnic settlement here, here, here in town. Um, kind of on the other end of the scale, but still um, in, in, in a city, 
um, is a very urban historic district, the Gold Coast Historic District in Omaha. It tells us something very significant about the, a particular era of Omaha's development. Um, it started out as a place where, uh, frankly, the rich folks all lived up on the hill along what used to be called the, the uh, West Farnham neighborhood, uh, up on the hill, kind of looked down onto the river valley. Um, as time marched on, very large lots were subdivided into smaller lots where you find then smaller scale houses occupying parts of lots that the very large houses, which are still there, uh, um, uh, used to have as, as their lot. The Joslin Castle, for example, is in this neighborhood. The Central Hastings Historic, Historic District going to a, a smaller community with a really, relatively speaking, vast residential historic district tells us a great deal about how uh, Hastings was settled and planned um, over the course of about 40 years. Uh, University Place here in Lincoln um, tells us a great deal about the area around Nebraska Wesleyan University, how that came to be, who, who moved there, how, what they felt were the important architectural styles that they, that, they, that they built. These buildings would not individually be good candidates for the National Register, but taken as a collection, taken as a whole, they tell us something significant about our community. Very different, yet still in the same community, is the Mount Emerald and Capital Editions historic district. Again, learning something about your community, learning something about your history in each individual community. Every community has a different story. Every community has a different concept of what it is that's important to them. And that's what we recognize in terms of historic buildings. The Seward Street Historic District, a very different animal yet. Um, a late 19th, early 20th century historic district associated with Willa Cather, probably Nebraska's most famous, famous author. That's why it's listed in the National Register of Historic Places. And of course we have Things like the, the Quonset Hut neighborhood in, in, in Scotts Bluff. About 25 residences made up of Quonset huts. There's even a little Quonset garage there you can see on the upper left uh, that tells us something very significant. What it tells us is that right after World War II, people were desperate to find housing and there just wasn't much out there. The materials were scarce, contractors were scarce, and everybody wanted a new home. And so in this particular circumstance, they used Quonset huts tells us something very significant about the development of modular homes and also about um, the, the, the housing of the day. Um, of the 40 historic districts that um, roughly that we have in Nebraska, most of them, um, there are a large number of residential districts, but most of them are actually commercial historic districts. Historic districts that tell us something significant about regional commercial development, about regional uh, business development, and also about how our communities um, e evolved over time. Um, if, you're, if you're at all like me, um, if you, when you drive around and you travel around the state or anywhere else, if, if you drive, pull off the road and you want to see what a town looks like, the first place you drive is you drive down their main street, you drive down their downtown. Well, these, these downtowns, these, these, these central business districts, the older central business tells a great deal about the community in which they're located. I think you can learn more from that um, than, than just about anything else. And we have a large variation in what these districts look like across the state. Um, the Fremont commercial downtowns, basically a first generation um, 19th century commercial historic district. You go out to Grant, out Perkins County, out by the Colorado border, uh, and you've got a, what we call, consider a second generation commercial historic district. The first generation was made up of frame, boomtown front buildings. They're all gone in the late teens and early 20s. Um, and there's a, there's a story here. There's a reason why these things happen. Uh, they were replaced by these one-story brick buildings. This entire district was built within about a seven-year period. They replaced all their frame buildings with the, with the brick building. It tells us something very significant about this area and what was going on at that time. Um, again, um, very urban, uh, very significant historic district, the old market in Omaha. Uh, uh, tells us something very significant about Omaha's business development and what made Omaha Omaha at one time. Um, you had the stockyards on, on the one hand, and on the other hand you had this, this massive kind of warehouse and jobbing industry um, that it, uh, is now um, represented by uh, the Rail and Commerce and Old Market Historic District. The Fairbury Commercial District is one of, one of the most interesting, in, at least in my opinion, in the state, uh, a community that had a great deal of, of, of uh, success economically uh, throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Um, and also has, has not only industrial and railroad base, uh, but, a, but an agricultural base. And the, the downtown Courthouse Square, lovely, lovely downtown Courthouse Square, um, is bounded on one side by a lot of industrial and agricultural properties, which are all listed in the National Register because they tell us something about the development in, in Fairbury. Um, historic districts, as I mentioned, in, in, in Nebraska range anywhere from eight 
all the way up to we're considering in October, we'll consider an historic district that has over a thousand buildings in it. This is the eight building district. This is Unadilla's historic district in Odo County. Eight buildings. Um, it is what it is. It's all there ever was. Um, and there's a great story behind um, that, that I've talked about before that I won't today about why these buildings curve away from us in this photograph as they do. Something very significant about this little town of about 300 people. And the rail and commerce district, of course, in Omaha, larger scale than, than uh, uh, the uh, old market. These buildings, are, if you're familiar with the, the uh, uh, old market lofts, um, the, the butternut building that um, uh, had a, tr a bad fire a few months ago, those are in the rail and commerce district. It's directly adjacent south of the, the old market. Um, there are a broad range of buildings. I, 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 don't, I don't want you to think that all we're talking about is houses and, and commercial buildings, but there's a huge number of buildings in the state that in all of our communities that mean something to all of us, that mean something to us who live in these communities. Um, when we talk about things that when, when people want to say, you know, there's a, there's a theater, there's a gas station, or so on, there, there's, there's a hotel that everybody in the community recognizes that, that has a real community focus in terms of what, there's, what its significance is. And that runs the, the gamut um, from uh, Second Empire Hotel and, and Taylor that was built because they thought the railroad was coming and never quite made it that far. Um, uh, the Hardington Hotel in Cedar County in the northeast part of the state very representative of a very large number of these t smaller types of hotels that, that catered to the, the traveling business person primarily in smaller towns across the state, mostly built in, in the kind of early 20th century. Antelope Grocery in Lincoln, very representative of neighborhood development in this town, in this city. Um, the Fox Theater, North Platte, most communities either have a theater, a historic theater they're very proud of, or used to have one and wish it was still there. Um, the Fox Theater in North Platte um, is still there, still used as, as the Nettle Center. Um, the Balcony House out in the southwest part of the state, again, out by the Colorado border, uh, represents a very important aspect of Nebraska history, transportation history. It's on the Detroit-Lincoln-Denver, the DLD Highway in Imperial, um, and developed over time. Believe it or not, in the middle of that building is an old schoolhouse. That's what started out. The schoolhouse was the office for a cabin camp. It kind of grew up in bits and pieces as now operated as a bed and breakfast, but it was a motel at one time that serviced travelers on the DLD. Loma Beach, classic example of transportation related kind of resort area, um, halfway between Lincoln and Omaha, and home of one of Nebraska's two lighthouses. Um, and of course, uh, public buildings, buildings that, that, that we all built, that we all helped pay for, um, like the Municipal Lighting and Waterworks Building in Lincoln, and of course, you know, schools. Um, uh, both of these buildings, in fact, in the 80s, uh, were rehabilitated using the investment tax credit um, uh, and are listed in the National Register. Theaters, again, um, this is a, a building that uh, people in Scotts Bluff I know are extremely proud of, the Midwest Theater, uh, uh, and gas stations, again, representing that, that transportation history. This gas station has been recently rehabilitated into a um, uh, drive-up bank. Um, Again, public buildings, uh, the Walnut School in Grand Island, it means a great deal to folks in, in Grand Island, to, 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 to the entire community. Um, and Carnegie Libraries, there are a number of those listed across the state. This one was actually rehabilitated um, for use as an as a engineering firm's offices. Um, and even in Omaha, uh, where uh, surrounded by the urban area is the Weber Mill, uh, which uh, is known locally as the Old Mormon Mill, uh, kind of surrounded by the city, uh, but um, still a significant kind of touchstone to Omaha's uh, more uh, agricultural past. Speaking of, um, the other properties that we deal with a lot in our office that are considered historic are, of course, agricultural properties. Um, I think it's one thing, there's one commonality in Nebraska um, is either the agricultural industry or ways that industry has been serviced, even, even Lincoln and Omaha. Um, Sanford Dugout in Sioux County is the only dugout that we know of in the state that actually is still, is, is not archaeology, it's to this extent, it was actually housed ranch hands up through the, up through the 1950s. Um, grain elevators, there are several grain elevators listed in the National Register. Um, the old Ithaca grain elevator is a good example. Um, <clears throat> Zavadil Farmstead representing Czech settlement agriculture in, in Cedar County in the northeast part of the state. Um, barns, uh, we deal with a great deal in the office. What do you do with them? Um, their maintenance and, and rehabilitation is enormously expensive, uh, and they tend to be functionally obsolete. You can't drive a 12-row corn head into a dairy barn that was built in 1906. 
um, all around Kimball County. We have Brookside Farm, which represents kind of a, a varied agricultural practices in that part of the world. Um, Spade Ranch, um, the kind of nationally famous Spade Ranch, where Bartlett Richards um, established his empire in Sheridan County is listed in the National Register, representing that aspect of Nebraska agricultural history. And, and, the, and the guy really was called Old McDonald even way back then, farm in, in, in Washington. Um, we kept asking, really? Is that really the name of it? Washington County. Um, lovely, lovely setting, uh, beautiful farmstead, recently rehabilitated. Uh, and of course, here in Lancaster County, we have um, a large number of, of significant historic agricultural properties. Um, this, this is the, the Herder Farmstead was rehabilitated um, recently in the mid-1990s. Um, so that's how we define historic, at least in our office, and that's how states define historic uh, across the country um, when they talk about their incentive programs. Um, I'd like to talk to you briefly about how we got to be where we are in terms of Amendment 1. Again, I want to emphasize that our office s served as a uh, kind of research staff for the legislature through a series of, of actions. In 1992, the legislature um, passed LB 706, which created the Nebraska Task Force on Historic Preservation. Task Force was made up of uh, citizens from across the state who uh, were interested in historic preservation, and they met in public meetings all over the state invited people from the communities to come in and tell them what they thought was important about historic preservation, what the needs of historic preservation were, and uh, uh, how preservation should be uh, uh, done in Nebraska. Um, <clears throat> its final report was published in 1995. Uh, so that's, that's, and we served as kind of the research staff for, for the task force on Nebraska, uh, Nebraska Task Force on Historic Preservation. Concurrently with the uh, task force was uh, the University of Nebraska Lincoln uh, finished a uh, uh, annual social indicator study um, that specifically was geared towards historic questions about historic preservation. Um, uh, the, the kind of the yin and yang of getting the pulse of what historic preservation meant to pe means to people in Nebraska. Um, on the one hand, you've got the task force, which is asking people who actually come to your meeting to tell you what they think. So they're obviously already interested about historic preservation. On the other, a scientifically managed study about uh, a poll that was, that was done to, to determine what um, the state uh, felt about historic preservation. And the, and the, the findings were, were interesting. I'll start with the NASIS because that, to me, is one of the most interesting. Um, fully 98% of the people uh, who were in the NASIS survey felt that historic preservation was important to the state of Nebraska. I would guess that you could put 100 people in a room and you couldn't get 98 of them to agree which way was up. So this, is, this, was, this meant something to our office. I mean, this was something that we um, thought was uh, very interesting. So, which was, to me is even more surprising was that fully 74%, almost three quarters of the people surveyed in the NACE study, uh, felt that it was important that government should help pay, and this is the way it's worded in the survey question, the government should help pay for historic preservation. The task force recommendations included a rec broad recommendation that actually is two pages long, and I synthesized it down into this little sentence here, that Nebraska needed preservation, Nebraska didn't have any preservation incentives, needed historic preservation incentives to promote economic development, community revitalization, and heritage tourism. And specifically within that two and a half, three pages, that Nebraska needed to pass legislation that would include a property tax assessment freeze. How would it work? How does an assessment freeze work in other states? Well, again, I, have, I do have personal experience in this, so I, can, I think I can pretty accurately describe for you how this works in other states. Um, the way an assessment freeze works is that you have a historic building that's assessed at a certain value. If a property owner rehabilitates that building, they're immediately struck with an increase in their assessed valuation. Um, this is not a knock against assessors by any stretch of the imagination. That's what they do. That's what's supposed to happen. In Nebraska, the way it's set up now, there's a disincentive for people to maintain or rehabilitate their historic buildings because, because of this, this structure, the way, the way things are structured. What a freeze does is freeze the assessment, again, in other states, freezes the assessment um, at the pre-rehabilitation level. In every state that we're aware of, it's a temporary freeze. Um, that the freeze doesn't stay on forever. 
um, to allow the property, the idea is to allow the property owner a chance to kind of recoup um, their investment before the assessed valuation goes up. Uh, this is the, the language um, on L of LR2CA, which is now known as Amendment 1. This is the ballot language. This is the way it'll appear on the November 2nd general election ballot. And of course, a vote against Amendment 1 would, would not do anything. There would be no change to the Constitution if the, if the vote is, is, is no. Um, the, the idea behind the, the assessment freeze is that, that uh, well, in, in terms of how the revenue stream works, one of the reasons why I think, whoops, sorry, I went the wrong way there. Um, well, let me get to this first. Uh, this has been a very, <laughs> trust me on this, because um, uh, uh, this has been a very thoroughly researched proposal um, in terms of the amendment. The legislature, I think, really did the kind of thing that you really hope your legislature does do before they propose something as drastic as a constitutional amendment. Um, one of the questions that they wanted to answer was, what is the cost? Um, in our view, um, the way we looked at it in Illinois, and I know the, the way that other states, um, well, I don't know, I'm certain that other states look at it, is a, a pr program like this is, is revenue neutral. Um, you don't take the property off the tax roll. It continues to pay the taxes that it paid before the rehabilitation. It simply doesn't see an assessment increase. The, the, tax, the tax rate doesn't change. Uh, the, tax, uh, the, uh, uh, the taxes, in fact, the tax rate can increase. If the taxing bodies choose to increase tax rate, it can go up, and the property owner then pays correspondingly. What it does is simply freeze the assessment. Um, but the legislature wanted, okay, but really, what does that mean in terms of, of, of percentages of property? Again, this was somewhat surprising to us. We didn't do this research. The Nebraska Department of Property Assessment and Taxation did this research. They're responsible for the, the nine counties dodged through uh, Sherman that you see here on, on the screen. Uh, they're responsible for actually administering the assessment and, taxa property assessment and taxation of these nine counties. Um, they also, the legislature, they also looked at Lancaster and Douglas County because they have the, the highest number of historic properties listed in the National Register right now. Um, uh, and the question was, what percentage of the tax base? How is this going to affect the tax base? Very reasonable question. Um, and the, the, the answer that, that NDPAT came back with was that it is not a significant, I mean, this is a, a quote from the memo to, the, to the, uh, the legislative committee that was looking at this. Um, it's not a significant percentage of the tax base. In fact, in the highest percentage in the nine, 11 counties that they looked at was Lancaster County at um, not quite four-tenths of one percent. Um, and in fact, in several of the counties that, they, that NDPAT looked at, the, the percentage of the tax base that would be affected if every single property listed in the National Register took advantage of the incentive. If they all took advantage of it, the, the net effect on the property tax base would still be zero, um, uh, statistic, statistically zero. Uh, obviously, it wouldn't be exactly zero. Um, for the, for the, uh, the five counties, Dakota, Garfield, Greeley, Hitchcock, Harlan, Keith, and Sherman, um, that's what the NDPT found. So, the question then is obviously, well then, wh why even do this? If there's so few properties, wh why would you bother to do something as, as significant as amending the Constitution? Well, it goes back to what's historic and what our communities are. And, and, then, and I, I haven't done a poll of all 37 states that, that have passed this, but, um, or, you know, and I didn't you know, ask the legislators who were working this what they were doing, but, but, if, I, but if, if, I, if I were to kind of think about what, I, what I'm pretty sure happens is that, is that these buildings have, historic buildings have a uh, value to the communities in which they reside above and beyond any monetary, flat monetary value. They mean something to the community um, greater than just how much they're worth. Um, when you're talking about things like uh, the Livestock Exchange building in Omaha or uh, the former Stewart Theater here in Lincoln or the Haymarket or the Old Market or buildings like that, there, there's a community value inherent in those things that people like to think about when they think about why they live in their communities. Now, why do we live where we live? What is it about our communities that, we're, that we think about when we think about what our community means and what it is? Well, in many instances, what that means is one of the things it means is the, the livability and habitability of the community, which includes historic properties, historic buildings. I think that's, that's one thing. Um, another reason why I think this is so popular and why the legislature chose this approach, again, I'm just speaking 
kind of because I've been working on this for 10 years now. Um, <clears throat> and what I found is that in terms of cost-benefit ratio, I think it's fairly clear that there's, there's very little actual cost to a program like this. I mean, you, you saw the figures from NDPAT. Um, and I think that's true nationally. I, I don't think you're going to find a state where you're going to see there's a, there's a significant percentage of the local tax base is made up of historic buildings. Um, and in our research, we know this is just a snapshot of uh, this, this slide. This is a snapshot of what our research found and what other states think they're getting out of programs like this. Um, you know, $54 million, is that's a lot of money spent on owner-occupied homes. Um, in a statewide, even over five years, even a state as big as Georgia. Um, again, back to kind of the nuts and bolts of how this works. In, in Illinois, anyway, I can speak from personal experience here. In, in Illinois, it's an eight-year program. The assessed valuation is frozen for, for four years, and it's allowed to go up 25% per year over the next four years. So it's an eight-year program, but it's only frozen at the pre-rehab level for four years. South Dakota is also an eight-year program. It used to be a four-year program. By popular demand, the legislature turned it into a full eight-year program. It's frozen for eight years in South Dakota now. Um, so I think, you know, you've got, first you've got, you know, there's, there's, a, there's an acknowledgement and understanding, you know, nationally. I, think it, I don't think you'd find much argument about this, that, that historic buildings have meaning that are important, um, that, that they, they mean something to communities in which they reside. Um, I think that um, it's, this is a, in terms of cost benefit, I think in terms of uh, overall cost, I think programs like this, it's acknowledged, have, are, are, are are, are worth it nationally. Um, and, then, and then also, and I'm, I'm pretty sure this is true in Nebraska because you know, we did talk to these folks, um, talk to the legislators as they went through this. There's a real appeal to a program like this, especially in states like Nebraska, because I, I know this was true in Illinois, that have a real urban, rural division. Um, this program can be applied to everything from barns to the old market. Um, so, I think, I, I, again, I know that was true in Illinois, um, where there was the Chicago and then there was everybody else. Um, so I think, I mean, that was one of the other appeals to the legislature in terms of, of, of why they chose this avenue to provide, to, to, to at least propose um, to provide um, preservation incentives uh, because of that, that kind of broad demographic uh, of, of, of how the thing can be used. Um, I want to just say, say again, I, I really, um, I do this for a living, so I care a great deal about historic buildings, so if that passion comes through, I can't help it. Um, and I actually, before I worked in state government, I worked in retail management, and I actually managed a couple of businesses in, in a historic downtown, so that's how, kind of how I got here. I, mean, I understand the business side of it, too. Um, but I want to reiterate that the, the, the State Historical Society really, we, we, we cannot, we, we don't take a position on this one or the other, but we are the kind of logical uh, source of, of, of information for anybody who wants to know about preservation and programs nationally. This is how you can get a hold of us. Um, we try, we're, the State Preservation Office is a very small office. Uh, I think there's only six of us left, five maybe, I can't remember, who do actually program, who do program work. Um, but we try to make ourselves as accessible as, as possible. Um, and uh, so, you know, please call if you have any, if you have any questions about historic preservation in Nebraska, the National Register, the, tax, the income tax credits, or our historic building survey, or certified local government programs. Um, and with that, I am going to end and open it up for questions. Yes, ma'am. Because this bond issue just, you know, didn't pass here in Lincoln, uh, why didn't the, the amendment have any provision for when these might go back on the books for this increased tax, like the four years, the eight years? I mean, and I, I can understand, I work for the state, so I know that. Okay. The, the, question, the question was, why doesn't the amendment have provision for, explicit provision for how the number of years that the temporary freeze would take place? Um, and I, 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 I can't say for certain, but I assume that, that th th this is Amendment 1 simply enables the, le enables the legislature to fa pass future legislation. My understanding of how constitutional amendments work is you keep them as simple as possible. You don't, you don't legislate through the Constitution. Um, and th the idea is that this, this, the, the, the number of years that you'd make it temporary would be a legislative 
question. Um, I, 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 it brings up a, a, something I would like to touch on, though. This isn't the first time that w there are a number of provisions like this in the Constitution already. There's a, there's a homestead ex exemption in the Constitution. There's um, exemption from environmentally sensitive properties. There's exemption, I believe, for disabled veterans. So this is the, it's not something that's, that's totally out of the ordinary. Yeah. Yes? The way it has to be done in Nebraska is that first they have to pass this constitutional amendment, which is an enabling amendment that then allows the legislature to pass the specific laws. And then simply uh, because of past court cases and other things, that's the way it has to be done. We can't just go directly to legislation like most other states can. We have to do this enabling amendment first. So in, in case you couldn't hear that, the explanation that was, uh, is, is that the, through case law, Nebraska case law, this is the way it had to be written. Is there anybody here that's like on a committee for that constitution? Because that's the kind of stuff I think that it's going to have to be put out in the community that you know this is just the beginning to enable the legislature to do something rather than that they will there will be things in the legislature. That's that, and and. and Thank you for bringing that up again because I do want to emphasize again. One, one thing I want to emphasize is that, and that's one of the questions that we've been getting: why we're doing this brown bag today. One of the reasons we're doing this brown bag today, because all Amendment One, to every everything I talked about just now, is about what other states have done with legislation. Other states are able to deal with this kind of issue legislatively. Nebraska case law doesn't allow us to do that. This has to be handled through a constitutional amendment. All Amendment One does. All it does is enable the legislature to pass legislation that may or may not look like everything I just talked about. Uh, but it would, well, that's not true. It would, it, the, way, the way it's, let me go back to the language. The language makes it clear that we're talking about the assessed value of a property um, that results strictly from renovation or rehabilitation. Um, that, that much, that's, that would be, that's, you know, that has to be it. Um, and, 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 and the reason why it's important, I think, to, to specify that it's due to rehabilitation because property values go up all the time. And we, and we don't, I, I'm assuming that the legislature doesn't want that to apply to, to a store property. Bill. Yes? Um, there really isn't any guarantee, even if Amendment 1 passes, is there, that the law a, a future law would pass the legislature. I mean, this authorizes the legislature to have the conversation and to debate, to create a bill and to debate that bill. Mm -hmm. But right. but this doesn't demand. Am I correct? That's right. That's correct. Yeah. The, que the the question was, this the the, the the constitutional amendment does not require that legislation be passed, and that's absolutely true. Just because this gets passed doesn't mean we'll ever have a preservation incentive in Nebraska. But it, but it allows for, it enables the legislature to pass this type of incentive should they choose. And of course, that, that debate, if it occurs, will occur you know, through the legislative process. But the, but the amendment does not require passage of legislation. Um, and if I were going to bet on it, I'd say it's, it would be a while if Amendment 1 passes, be a while before legislation gets passed, because that's a very public, you know, what is it, sausages and laws? You don't want to see how they actually get done. Um, you know, it's a very public, very kind of out in the open process, and that's what will happen if it comes to that. You know, we, we, you know, we just, there's no way to say. But that's a good point. You know, did I really, I explained this so clearly and so thoroughly that you all have no questions about this at all. Wow. wow. Kind of impressed. Okay. Thank you all very much for coming this afternoon and um, enjoy your day.